and thank you for joining IDEX Health and Science for our series on optimizing fluidics for IVD. Today's segment surveys connections in IVD, manifolds, fittings, and tubing. Today we have a number of product experts with us from IDEX Health and Science, as well as a guest, a design engineer and system developer in IVD, and our format for this program will be a brief overview and introduction of the participants, followed by a roundtable discussion. That will last approximately 20 minutes, after which we'll answer questions sent in from those of you listening on the phone, and you can begin keying your questions anytime into the box provided. If you're viewing this program as an on-demand webinar, you will hear the question from the original webcast, and later in the program, we'll give you an email address to send us any questions that you may still have. We'll ask three quick survey questions throughout the program, and we'd like to hear from you what you're looking for on the subjects of fluidic systems and fluidic optimization. I'll take a moment now to go around the room and introduce each participant in today's webinar. You'll also see on your screen some additional details about each person's fluidic experience and product specialties. Our guest today is John Manulo. John's a mechanical engineer and system developer for several instrument platforms with more than 25 years of experience. Currently, he's the principal consultant at Fluidics Design Incorporated. Brad Bessie is the VP of Business Development for IVD at IDEX. His background includes deep familiarity with Sapphire Engineering precision dispense pumps from IDEX. Darren Lewis is a scientist, and Darren manages research and technology development for IDEX Health and Science. Caitlin McEatherin is also a scientist and product manager. She'll address our health and science connection specialties, manifolds, fittings, and tubing for diagnostics. Mechanical engineer Jeff Stokes has extensive experience designing fluid handling hardware from atmospheric liquid handling robots to UHPLC pumps and valves. Here at IDEX, Jeff leads our system integration projects. I'm Bob McCarthy, R&D Director at IDEX Health and Science. Throughout my career, I've worked in a range of instrumentation from cell culture systems to drug discovery systems in regulated environments. I'll be your moderator for all five segments of our series of webinars, Optimizing Fluidics for IVD. If you need to sign up for the remaining programs, one each month, visit webinar.idex-hs.com, or you can catch them for later playback, and I believe we'll have them available for download as podcasts as well. One quick note before we get started with our roundtable discussion. We want these discussions to be open and informative for the engineers who are our customers, but that said, because we deal with innovative, often patent-pending scientific technologies, we're bound by non-disclosure agreements. That means we won't be able to give you the exact name of recognizable partners or platforms. We'll just refer to them generically as a leading hematology manufacturer, for instance, or a life science assay instrument. The stories are real. The names have been changed to protect everyone. Let's ask a survey question. What style of tubing connector do you use? Flexible tubing and hose barbs? Flared tubing with threaded fittings? Fittings with ferrules? Or another option? Okay, so to kick this section off, I'd like to start this way. I've heard it said that connections, fittings, and tubing are a minor and simple part of the system and easy to deal with. Actually, our experience has challenged that notion. That's true, Bob. I would say that a lot of system designers that I've worked with tend to leave the fittings and the, the connections piece of the instrument design till the very end. And while they might be underrating the importance of this, by doing so, none of them would argue that a clog or a leak in their connections could just be a showstopper for whatever analysis that they're performing. Um, it seems that typically these designers will go back to whatever was used on the last platform that they developed or um, what they've been used to for years. That could be a barb type of fitting with flexible tubing or it could just be flared tubing um, with a quarter 28 style connection. But what's been most exciting for our team of engineers that are working on tubing assembly development with our customers is when a customer comes along with a particular challenge. And I have one in mind, actually, where a customer was trying to fit a large number of tubes in a very small, tight, compact area. And so we were able to introduce them to a much smaller thread pitch on their fitting connector. And that was allowed them, by just moving from a quarter 28 size fitting to a 640 thread pitch, it allowed them to fit twice as many tubes in the same square footprint as they did before. That was a very specific example of 
a design challenge that appeared because the fittings were a little bit of an afterthought. It might have been also one that a manifold could have applied very easily to, somewhere that had a lot of fluidic interconnects within a block of acrylic or another type of polymer material that um, fed through different solenoid valves and whatever the application might be. And oftentimes a manifold can move around a space constraint unlike tubing and fittings ever can. Now, there are also um, other considerations that the customer, uh, the designers need to keep in mind while they're looking at their connections design, and that might be um, serviceability. It's really important that any type of connections that need to be broken and remade often in the field for replacing out inline filters or something to that effect are robust and reliable, and we won't see those leaks that might occur if they haven't been properly tightened down again. So leaks are definitely one of the more common problems that we see our customers facing, correct? Yes, and leaks always have a tendency of finding the most expensive electronics to fry. (laughs) Good point. (laughs) That's why we've started to see a lot of customers move towards a super flangeless ferrule system and away from flared tubing when they're using a more standard style fitting like a quarter 28 or an M6 threaded connection into whatever component it may be. A super flangeless fitting has some obvious advantages that our customers are realizing. It doesn't twist on the tubing as they tighten it down. It doesn't back out during vibration when the instrument's vibrating, moving around. And the super flangeless has a separate ferrule that clamps on the tube, right? Correct. Instead of having a flange on the bottom? Right, exactly, which makes it a little bit more easy to repair in the field as well. Where Is it more makes and breaks of the connection mm-hmm. are, are allowed or, or are enabled by having this ferrule, am I right? That is absolutely right. That's a big deal. Right. We've had actually a – we worked with a customer to do some pressure testing after – Uh, repeated cycles of making and breaking. And we found that the super flangeless ferrule fitting combination won out over a flared tubing connection every time. So now are people, I mean, I know we do a lot of work to supplying tubing fittings, but also a lot of the areas where we've grown in recent years has really been in tubing assemblies. That's absolutely right. Yes, we've, um, for example, even that customer that I just mentioned that did all the testing on flared versus Super flangeless fittings has now standardized on a super flangeless kit uh, with a bunch of different tubing harnesses in it with super flangeless fittings connected on each end. They have custom lengths. They have custom heat shrink on the ends to indicate where on the instrument it needs to be installed. It might have labeling on it and on the heat shrink, that is, and we can package it all together in a nice, clean bag with their label on it so that it arrives and it's, it's ready to go. Another customer that I worked with found that so much easier once they we'd been through the design process and he, they started receiving in their bags of a tubing harness kit that they didn't have to be managing multiple vendors and quite a bit of inventory of tubing spools that they were cutting on site and various fittings from different vendors and instead they could just have a complete solution right out of the box. I guess I wanted to ask just a little bit. I, I, as a follow-on to this, um, I was really impressed on a couple of the projects I was on with the tubing bending that was able to really clean up and pretty much harness the tubing in a much different way, keeping it away from sharp edges and, and really making the whole system a whole lot more easy to access and, and service. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the, the way you do that bending. Sure, we thermoform all of our polymer tubing, and it provides quite a bit of benefits to the instrument design. Um, It can be strain relief. It's just overall, you mentioned just the contours of the instrument, and it provides a real clean and tidy appearance. And the coil, if we add a coil, it could be on a robotic arm that would just assist with movement, and um, potentially the coil could even be a fluidic reservoir for uh, pre- a certain developing a certain pressure in some part of the system, a, or a certain volume for another aspect of the design. Accumulator, that sort of thing. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, what we've developed in house at IDEX is a rapid prototyping system for these form tubes, and we like to call it our erector set. And 
what we can do is very quickly turn around essentially a breadboard form tube design to a customer. It makes for a very collaborative effort on designing these to really custom be fit into their instrument. So a customer might send us a napkin sketch, essentially, of the contours that they're looking for, and we can turn that around a couple prototypes to them in just a matter of a week, and they can evaluate it, test it out, say, hey, this leg needs to be a little bit shorter, and then we can try it again until we've got the design locked down, and then we would actually go at that point and build a a production tool and validate that and move into um, something that would be a a qualified uh, quick-turn type of formed tubing system for them. Excellent. Uh, Those of you uh, doing your napkin sketches will give you a mailing address later. (laughs) Survey time. Do you have any experience using manifolds, yes or no? Isn't it nice to get an easy one once in a while? So why not use a manifold in, in some of these situations? I mean, we sell a lot of manifolds. Uh, we have, you know, a 30-year experience in developing and manufacturing and designing manifolds for IBD instruments. You know, when would a customer use manifolding versus um uh, a lot of tubing or tubing assemblies? What are some of the trade-offs that you get? So I think before you make a decision about a manifold or whether you're going to use tubing for an application, you really want to look very closely at where the fluids are flowing and what, what precision is required and accuracy. of The components that you're going to want to throw away uh, if the system clogs, a variety of other uh, factors like that probably need to be taken into account. Manifolds often make a very good choice um, for for applications where um, you want to reduce the complexity of a tubing kit. Um, tubing can be very handy, though, if there's a section of um, flow path that will get clogged and you want to simply throw something out that's relatively inexpensive and, and pretty easy to reinstall. So here's what's great about working on some of these projects from where I sit. You know, we have both tubing fittings for connection and we have manifolds, and we have customers that have somewhat sophisticated flow paths and they have to integrate with, you know, very intimately with a set of optics, sometimes with a flow cell. What we can do and what we've been doing recently, there's a customer we've been working working with in the last month that has a very fast time to market requirement and a breadboard that's working, but they actually can redesign their optics around our fluidics if we can help them standardize some connections and, and really make that a much more robust system long term. And we, what we've done is we've given them approximately 12 options of, you know, increasing complexity of manifolding that reduces connections and, therefore, chances for leaks and chances for problems in terms of troubleshooting. And there are trade-offs with each one of these. And we can lay that out very rapidly, literally over the course of days, and have, you know, be a partner with them to help them choose what's the best, best way to go from there when that's not their expertise necessarily. Also, I think you should mention there are ways to mitigate you know, while, while clogging is a major issue, there are ways to mitigate that. If, if people know what they're using in their system, right. mm-hmm. whether you have a, a wash system to clean out the manifold afterwards after a run, or is there a way to put out, and put in some sort of clean out port? Clean. That's where knowing what your fluids are, whether you've got fiber in them or something that's going to come out of them, but also, I mean, knowing that the, if you know that ahead of time, it may be able to be designed into the manifold. And, and that's what we do. So a generic example, for instance, um, say you have a number of pumps and multiple solenoid valves, maybe some detection optics, and a few other components like a rotary shear valve that, that basically is a selector. If, if that, those are spread all over the instrument and connected with, you know, kind of a spaghetti of tubing and multiple connection points that could leak, there's the option that we can put together one or multiples of those. It both brings... A lot of things together that it makes it easy to troubleshoot. You could have, you know, a bank of connections that are color-coded or labeled. But more than that, you, you basically can organize the system and optimize flow path, and, and it brings you into a realm with a partner that can do much more than just buying parts off the shelf and having to integrate them yourself. And what also comes from this is you now have a complete assembly, fully tested. Mm-hmm. Instead of having multiple stocked parts in your in your warehouse that you're going to assemble, this comes directly from Fidex yeah. to you as a packaged, fully tested, uh, finished product that you now take and put into your system. Big advantage. All right, for instance, um, you know, I'm thinking of a, a generic application where you have, say, multiple pumps and solenoid valves, maybe a rotary shear valve with a selector in there, 
um, and, and other you know elements that may be in you know connection to the optical system of an instrument, for instance. There's an opportunity there to have us, uh, IDEX, basically offer you know say ten alternatives of increasing you know uh, various levels of of integration so that you can have the solenoid valves integrated with a pump head. You could go beyond that and have all of those integrated with a, sh a rotary shear valve that's manifold mounted, for instance. You know, the choices and the trade-offs, you can go over on paper in 2D well before you have to make any decisions about prototyping or cost. And we can do that, you know, we can do it umpteen times. We can iterate that design with you many, many times and then provide you a breadboard in a very quick turn fashion and have you validate that in your system. So, Bob, maybe you wanted to talk about why a customer may want, you know, in some sense, certain circumstances, you know, a larger integrated single manifold versus kind of more smaller modular manifolds, um, what the benefits might be sure. in more tubing. Yeah, I mean, the the easy and obvious benefits are that you have fewer connections, right? You can, um, a lot like what we talked about in terms of density of connections, bring everything together and have sort of a, a place where all connections are made, easy to service and troubleshoot. So those are more obvious. But there's more subtle areas there where we can, we have diffusion bonding. We have many different techniques for putting together man together manifolds, and it can improve the flow path. It can reduce the problem with connections that you have dead spots in places where things clogs could occur. That sort of thing. There's options there that you know if it's the you know it's not one size fits all, but it is an option for designing a flow path that can optimize um, for removal of clogs and dead volume and that sort of thing, and certainly uh, improve reliability. So one example I can give of where we've used manifold technology is to help improve the performance of an instrument. Um, we worked with one of the leading hematology instrument designers in the U.S. and actually did a lunch and learn at their facility where we came down with our group of engineers and we did kind of an educational seminar of capabilities and what we can offer. And they came to us afterwards and said, you know, we're having a real problem where we have this instrument and it has some reliability and performance issues. We have leaks, we're having bubbles, we're having detection issues, and it has to do with how the system was configured. And then when we went in and looked at the system, it kind of looked like the rat's nest of tubing. And um, what we proposed as an alternative, once we sat down with them and understood the application limitations, was a manifold-enabled assembly. Basically, uh, it was a multi-layer Ultim manifold, I think four layers, with integrated solenoid valves and actually stainless steel probes that came from our, uh, our Upchurch brand um, product line. Um, integrated, so it's basically a probe valve, um, and all the fluidic routing was basically it's basically a fluidic circuit board, all into encased in, in an ultra manifold, and this dramatically improved the performance of the instrument and also made it um, a heck of a lot more cleaner. If you just open up the instrument, it's clean. There is that rat's nest is gone. You have simple tubing assemblies coming in from the reagent bottles going out um, to the other parts of the instrument. Um, very cleanly, and that rat's nest is eliminated completely. So and great, better for assembly, better for service. Yeah, yeah. completely. And then they actually get from us a fully tested certified assembly mm -hmm. where we actually do pressure testing and we cycle the valves and we make sure there's no leaks. Wow, 20 or even 25 minutes for a discussion is simply not enough time. For information on the three different ways IDEX Health and Science can optimize connections in your instrument, check out our instrument design resource. You can view, download, or request your free copy at www.idex-hs.com slash resource online. You can also contact our guest, fluidics engineer John Manulo. John consults independently with instrument manufacturers on fluidic design with a particular emphasis on IVD. Survey question. Our final survey question is a write-in. What fluidic topic would you like to see next? Write in your suggestions. Maybe it's an area you're having a problem with in your application, such as bubbles in your system, or maybe it's related to your next generation instrument. Where could good information help you? So it's time now for your questions, and, and thanks to those of you who have sent in your questions for our fluidic experts. Please uh, take your opportunity now to get a few more questions in uh, if you have any. Uh, a brief introduction here for another member of our team who's just been able to join us. Rob LaCroix is the product manager for our Eastern Plastics Manifold products. Uh, Rob's only been with us a few months, but has a lot of experience with connections products and connection strategies. 
he alerted me that he'd like to clarify our current design philosophy uh, around cleanout ports and manifolds. So since he's brand new, we'll throw him to the wolves. Uh, let's try jump right in on that topic before we answer all the questions. Uh, Rob, you have the mic. Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, uh, clogging the really the boogeyman of manif manifolds. Uh, many customers inquire about cleanout ports, and in theory, they work very well at uh, getting to a clog and removing it. Uh, but there is an issue, and that is dead volume and carryover at the plug fluid path interface that we have found um, when we have built manifolds with cleanout ports. So it is something to consider if you're really concerned about uh, dead volume and carryover that you may create fix one problem but uh, create another. Um, as mentioned in the uh, earlier portions of the presentation, a lot of clogging can be uh, minimized, if not eliminated, just by proper design of the manifold, a good wash protocol, and if there is an area that's really just prone to clogging, maybe replacing that with a tubing assembly or something of uh, that nature. Uh, but, you know, when you talk to us at IDEX, we'll walk through that part of uh, our, if we have a concern with you, and at least give you some options so that you can uh, proceed how you want to. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah. I think uh, if we continue down the path since we're on the topic of manifolds, uh, so stay tuned, Rob. Uh, another question that's just come in, let me throw this one out to you. Manifolds seem to be a big change for our development. What does a typical development timeline look like if, it, if, uh, if I generally know what I want for passage sizes, et cetera? Um, good question. Um, Really, you're looking at about four weeks on a, on a prototype if you, if you have a good idea of how you want your uh, fluid path to look. Um, and that can be from a napkin sketch to an actual simple manifold, you know, in your lab uh, with fluid running through it. Um, obviously, uh, it can go out from there depending on where you are in your application, the amount of integration you want, and things on, on that mind, in that um, scope. But, you know, four weeks is not unheard of. Okay, great. Um, here's another one that just uh, was sent in just now. Um, I'm going to keep you on the mic just one more time here, Rob. Um, what kind of transparent manifold material or surface finish do you use to avoid chemical attack by cleaning agents such as IPA, bleach, and acids? Well, part of that is um, you really have to understand what chemicals you're going to be using in, in, your, in your process and uh, what materials are chemically compatible with uh, with the, that process. Um, strong acids in uh, a concentrated form, you have to be careful with the materials. Uh, acrylic is clear, but it will be attacked by strong acids. If it's a weak solution, a weak bleach solution, or IPA, and it's part of your wash protocol, you're probably going to be okay. But each, each application is unique, and you do have to do uh, testing on the materials. Uh, we can make a very simple prototype for you to test if you do want to try, like an acrylic, um, or maybe go to something a little bit more chemically resistant, like an Altem, which is not as clear but may get you what you need for your application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, another one. We're going to move on to connections and tubing uh, a little bit here. Um, so, Caitlin, uh, this one I'm going to dish up to you. What about quick connects? We'd like to use uh, a valved quick connect for part of the system, but we're concerned about contamination, leaking, et cetera. What are some thoughts on uh, minimizing or eliminating those issues? Oh, that's a great question. Now, uh, we work with a bunch of different connection man of, uh, manufacturers if there's a part in our product line that we don't currently have available, such as the quick disconnects. And um, uh, Colder Products has a very extensive line of quick disconnects that include the valve systems, as you've asked, and um, they really are world-class in their ability to um, make connections that meet those various issues, such as leaking and such. And so um, that's something that normally we find on parts of the system, though, that are not critical for precision or sample handling. Um, that's something that works very well on the wash and the waste side of the instrument, where um, solvent bottles might need to be replaced often or something like that. And a typical wash cycle can very well clean out any kind of contamination that might be present from previous runs or waste lines and that sort of thing. Um, and again, we, we worked very closely with Colder for a few years and um, work to incorporate those in some of our tubing assemblies that I mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I could just uh, emphasize the point that we certainly – uh, 
Uh, IDEX uses our own internal brands. We work with third-party vendors uh, and put all of those together for optimizing Fluidix. Um, we understand that there might be preferences that we don't have. Of course, we'd like to have an opportunity to talk about our own brands, but we, we certainly are looking to optimize the system overall, first and foremost. Um, how about this one? Uh, you're, you've got the mic, Caitlin. I'm going to go through one more for you. Uh, I'm looking in a catalog. This is the question. I'm looking in a catalog, and I see all these choices of Teflon materials. Why would I pick one over the other? Well, that's a great question, one that we hear uh, fairly often. You'll notice that in our catalog we have um, melt-processable Teflon materials available in extruded tubes, and those include FEP, PFA and high purity PFA. We also have suppliers that supply us with PTFE and other common Teflon material. And all of these different Teflons share the great um, chemical inertness properties that Teflon is known for and a low coefficient of friction. But there are some distinguishing characteristics of the materials, including gas permeability, um, varies from grade to grade and clarity or the transparency of the material in the tubing and um, actually the flexibility also and the resistance to kinking. Uh, we have quite a bit more information on those different characteristics in a brochure you can find online called Diagnostic Grade Connections. Uh, that's in the literature section of our website. Terrific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let me throw this one out. I, I, keep, keep your questions coming. We've got a few more minutes. Um, here's one for you, John, John Mignolo. Uh, I understand that proper connections are critical, but aren't the port sizes already specified the, by the pump and valve manufacturers? Uh, Bob, uh, many of the valve companies now and pump companies uh, do offer both quarter 28 and M6 uh, bottom seal ports. Um, they're adopting to what's the, uh, what's out, what, what people are asking for out in the uh, industry. But also, that's for, that's for using discrete valves and pumps. But once you get into the design of a manifold, you pretty much pick your own style flat bottom port. If you want to use M6 or a quarter 28, that's up to you uh, as far as the designer goes. Uh, so that definitely helps you in your choices there. And, and there's also the various other port sizes that uh, you can for uh, can use for uh, uh, reducing size and, and getting multiple uh, fittings in a small area. Uh, so that's uh, one way of, 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 of skinning the cat. Uh, but also, the flat bottom port has become a de facto standard in the industry. Uh, you know, helps them carry over a good seal. And then many, many other pump manufacturers, including IDEX, you know, especially with their positive displacement pumps, piston displacement pumps, you have the, um, the uh, pump body, which can have any port machined into it. So that's definitely a big advantage. Thanks, John. Um, this is a great one. Uh, Caitlin, I'm going to surprise you again. Uh, this one's coming up pretty quick. Uh, what style of connection has the least likelihood of having or trapping air bubbles in the line? I know that I've heard that one quite a bit myself. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, the most important thing when you're making a connection between two pieces of tubing or um, a piece of tubing and a, a piece of instrumentation is to try to keep the flow path diameter as consistent as possible. And so we've found that the best way to do that is to use a, a threaded connection instead of a, a barb-style connection with softer tubing mm. or a connector that might have any uh, larger pocket where air bubbles could get trapped. And so... Um, Typically, what we always recommend to customers is to use a connector that has the same through-hole diameter as the tubing that they're connecting. That's very important. Yep, that sounds great. Uh, well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. There's a few more questions, and we'll try to answer those uh, by email. And But, but don't uh, send any other, others in, and we will definitely try to get answers to all of you. So thanks to all of you who have, who have sent in those questions, and thank you also to our panel of experts uh, and to you, on, our listening audience, for joining us. Next month, our Fluidic webinar covers degassing and debubbling technologies for IVD. Both degassing and debubbling have been used for years in analytical instruments to increase accuracy and precision, and that holds great value for IVD as well. Please make sure you join us for that. Once again... On your screen, for additional questions, you can contact John Mignolo at john at fluidicsdesign.com or call him at 914-241-2048. To reach one of the participants from IDEX Health and Science, call 866-339-4653 
or email customerservice.hs at idexcorp.com. For other segments in this webinar series, visit webinar.idex. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure.